Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of his Son from the dead. That uh, is a benediction that's at the beginning of First Peter, and we're going to be looking at that if you want to turn there in your Bibles here in a moment. We're so thankful we can be together. I know I say a lot of the same things each time when I get up here, and, and I try to vary it because I know it's easy to sort of tune it out uh, when you, while well, the Todd saying all that stuff he always says at the beginning. But we are thankful for those who are visiting, and we do have some visitors with us, and some family members of our members here. We know we have um, uh, some who want very much to be here and are not able to be here. And some who are watching, a shout out to uh, Don and uh, and perhaps some others. And as Jack already expressed, uh, I want to echo our condolences to Virginia and the whole family and the, the sudden passing of Joe. Uh, truly our hearts go out to her and to all of them and we pray that uh, Lord, the Lord will grant them comfort and that through this he can draw them near to him. Of course that's always our prayer and uh, some of you present understand that kind of loss and even uh, a sudden loss of, of that kind and it may very well be the Lord can use you in a special way to, to comfort Virginia and her family. We want the Lord to use us in whatever we go through in this life to be able to bless each other. And we're going to talk in our lesson this morning about suffering. But I I wanted to mention Alexis too. I know uh, Jack also mentioned her and we've we've prayed about her. And uh, I posted, if you didn't see it, a picture of her. Some of you have been able to go see her, a few. And many others I'm sure would like to, haven't been able to, but I I posted a picture on Facebook. I haven't been on Facebook much uh, lately, but I wanted to put that there. You can go check that out. Um, I I suppose I need to put it on the church one as well, but it's on my personal one, and and we're friends. Many of us are in the congregation that have a Facebook account. We're all friends, and I love that about social media because we can share these things and uh, bless and encourage one another through them. And, and some of you share some hilarious stuff with me, too, that I even use in sermons later. So you never know when you send me something, it might turn up later. But also be careful, because you never know what I see on your Facebook <coughs> posts may come up in a sermon in another way, too. So behave when you're online. Keep that in mind. Well, what we're going to talk about today is not in our time a, a popular element of the Christian faith, but it is central to our faith. We know that all of Scripture centers around God becoming a man in Christ and suffering for our sins. And so the suffering of the Son of God, that's the central uh, theme of Scripture and that how He saves us through that and makes us right with God and reconciles us to God And we're called to suffer for Christ. As he suffered for us, we're called to endure whatever suffering we have to face, to belong to him, to follow him. We will suffer persecution. We're very blessed in our culture not to face the kind of violent, really the the kind of unspeakable, vicious, brutal treatment that so many Christians through the centuries have faced. Horrific things that uh, we can't even imagine. And there are many even now suffering brutal hardships for professing Christ, for calling on his name. And even though we may not face that kind of persecution, we still will, will find that as we follow Christ in one way or another, there, there is suffering that we're called to bear. And Peter addresses that in his letter. And what I want to call this from First Peter, this is, a, this is a theme that you see especially in P, uh, this first of Peter's two epistles here. And I want to call it suffering 
like our Savior. So write that down. <clears throat> if you're taking notes, that's the title you can put there at the top of the page. Suffering like our Savior. And when we think about the suffering that's being discussed here in 1 Peter, it's a certain kind of suffering because we know there are different reasons that we suffer. We, we can suffer deservedly because of our own actions, our own foolish choices, our own sinful actions can bring suffering to us. So we know because of sin, or if something maybe is not necessarily sinful, something is not wise, and we do, and it and it's, our suffering is self-caused in, in that case. Well, and there's a comfort that we can get from God even in, in enduring that. But what Peter is talking about in this letter becomes quite clear. He's talking about unjust suffering. Suffering that we do not bring upon ourselves and it's not deserved in any way. But not just unjust suffering because... People can suffer unjustly also for any number of reasons. There are people being persecuted and innocent people, in, in, a, in a sense, as far as their suffering goes, innocent sufferers enduring all kinds of hardships for all kinds of reasons. Peter's talking about, very specifically, and this is where he's going to use Christ as a model, unjust suffering because... We're following Christ for doing what's right, for being a Christian. That's what he has in view here. Look at how many times this comes up in the letter here. He talks about here not, not just suffering, but when he, he speaks of suffering because you're zealous, you're on fire for what is good. This is in chapter 3 where we're going to focus our attention here in a moment. Suffering, verse 14, for righteousness' sake. He speaks of being reviled for your good behavior. Suffering for doing good, verse 17. We'll see again in a moment. Go back to chapter 2. Suffering, he says quite explicitly there in the ESV. Suffering unjustly in verse 20 when you do good. And if you're insulted for the name of Christ. So it's obvious Peter was writing to saints who were enduring this kind of mistreatment. For the name of Christ. If any man suffers as a Christian, he says, that's where he talks about reasons you might suffer deservedly. He says, let none of you suffer as a murderer or an evildoer or a meddler in other men's matters. He said, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this name. And then he says, whoever suffers according to God's will, let him commit himself to God who judges righteously. So this is the context in which we're going to look at this passage. It, it, suffering is mentioned explicitly, being put to grief, chapter 1 and verse 6, through many trials. The letter starts that way, and you see it mentioned a number of times, but what, what we're focusing on is discussed at length. Look at, the, look at how you find these lengthy passages going through this throughout the letter. So obviously God is speaking to us here. This is the emphasis, and we're going to notice it by looking at one of these texts in particular, this one in chapter 3. All right, chapter 3. And what Peter tells us here, beginning in verse 13, when you suffer, here, this is our lead statement, we would call this, right? So I try to structure these things and make it helpful for us. And actually, it's not my favorite way to preach. Uh, I prefer a lot of times to just lecture and develop a subject and not even have major points. And that some of my favorite lessons are like that, and some of my favorite teaching and preaching, um, it, it, where, where you simply develop a topic and you, you talk through it. But I know we're, we're kind of conditioned where we, we remember things better if we have a, a, a title and a lead statement and we've got these major points that fit together well, three alliterated major points in a poem and a prayer, and then you're done. We, sometimes my preacher buddies and I joke that this is what you're trying to do when you uh, shape your sermons. And you can even now, we'll talk about this later, use the AI. Has any of you tried to tell the artificial intelligence like chat, GPT, or one of these AI devices to write you a sermon? And you can say, I want three alliterated points and a poem 
and uh, I want it to be up on this chapter or this subject. And so I was very skeptical of that until a preacher buddy of mine sent me an outline, a friend of mine, rather, uh, Wayne Scripture up in the St. Louis area. And he, he told me that he was using it to generate titles for his sermons. I go, come on, come on. Are you serious? Artificial intelligence using AI? Well, I mean, how could it? And then he sent me an outline that he got by it. I was like, I'm going to be out of a job here pretty soon. After I looked at it, I thought, that's pretty good. It was actually, it was quite, quite good and useful. See, now you're never going to know if I worked all week, you know, for, on these sermons or if I just asked the AI to write me a, an outline. But this is that lead statement that comes before each of the major points. So you got to remember, when you suffer for righteousness, first of all, know that you're blessed. <clears throat> all that, just to get to that, know that you are blessed. This is what Peter says here. Look at the text. Now, who is there to harm you? Of course, they were being harmed, but he's saying in the ultimate sense. <clears throat> who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer, and here it is, for righteousness sake, you'll be blessed. You'll be blessed. Doesn't this sound like the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus, the Beatitudes, right? Where Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Very similar language. He said, and blessed are you when men shall reproach you and revile you and say all manner of evil against you falsely. For my name's sake, rejoice. Jesus said, when that happens to you, rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. Right? So you think about how God takes note of that and somehow I'm to understand that, that God is going to going to compensate me for that. God, God is going to set that right. He's going to deal with that. And that should be a powerful incentive, Jesus said, and Peter as well. God's going to bless you for doing what's right. When you're tempted to give in because you don't want to be ostracized, you don't want to be labeled, you don't want to be, uh, face any kind of tension or hostility, just remember, remember, God's going to bless you if you'll do what's right. If you'll suffer for doing What's right? So he says, have no fear of them. Don't be troubled then. So he wants you to keep that in view. <clears throat> when you suffer for righteousness sake, excuse me, trust Christ and lovingly defend your faith. Now I love this verse. We quote it all the time, but we very seldom look at it in context. Usually we're quoting it uh, in connection with some other point. I want to look at it. Th this is a familiar verse to us, right? But let's, let's look at it carefully. So he says, but, don't, don't be troubled, don't be afraid, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense. That's the part I quote a lot when we're talking about defending the, the, the faith. Make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, but do it with gentleness and respect. Now look at this first of all. Honor Christ the the Lord as holy. And it's the word for holy or to, the verb for holy to, to sanctify. So your Bible might say sanctify in your heart Christ as Lord or something similar. Sanctify. How, how can you sanctify Christ? He is holy. Well, in your heart. He's talking about your attitude. This has to deal with our mindset that we have when we see the righteous suffer, when you suffer for doing what's right, when it's hard to be faithful. And he said, well, first thing you need to do is make sure you set Christ apart in your heart as Lord. In other words, remember, Christ is Lord. In your heart, keep this in view, that Christ is the one in charge, not the people who are doing the evil, not those who might be causing this hardship or standing in your way, standing in the way of righteousness. And sometimes it's easy to lose that perspective and it seems like the, those who are promoting wickedness and who are opposed to the Christian faith, like, like they're winning. They've captured the culture and they're successful in their efforts to oppose us and what we hold dear. We face this, as I often point out, this hostility. Many times in the courts, those who are uh, uh, 
of the anti-Christian persuasion used the legal system, the, the legal process to try to drive Christians from the public sphere, try to silence the church. But remember this, remember, they're not in charge. Ultimately, the Lord is in charge. Ultimately, it's Jesus who is sovereign Lord over everything, and he's going to deal with this. In his way, in his time, that's what you, you put Christ in your heart. Remember that he's the one in charge, he's Lord, and you make a defense, right? We quote this often, it's apologia, that Greek word, that where we get our word apologetics, the, the formal defense of the Christian faith, Christian apologetics, making a defense for what we believe. He says, you need to be ready. You need to be prepared. When you face suffering, people might think, well, why would you be willing to endure this hardship for what you believe? Why do you believe this stuff if people ridicule it and are opposed to it? Well, I need to be prepared to explain why. We, we have a basis for our faith that there is evidence for what we believe, and we need to be able to explain that to people. So that's where we often use this passage when we're talking about defending the fundamentals of the faith. When people ask you a reason, Christian faith is reasonable. It's not irrational. It's not against reason. It doesn't go beyond evidence. It's based on compelling evidence. So it's a reasonable faith, and we need to be able to explain that. When people, I love this, when they ask you for the hope that's in you, people should be able to look at us and say, how do you, how do you face life the way you do with this hope that you have that's getting you through these things that are so overwhelming sometimes? People should see that living hope that I, I mentioned earlier in that benediction from 1 Peter 1.3. He, he's, he's raised us, he's begotten us again unto a living hope. And that hope makes all the difference in how we view what we're going through. And people, we, we need to be able to tell them, this is why. Because this is why we can know that we have hope of ultimate victory and life beyond this life because of what Christ has done, because we know he's been raised. And here are the evidences for that. So notice he says to do it with the right spirit with gentleness or meekness, your Bible might say, and, and in a respectful way. This is hard to do a lot of times in social media. Sometimes you post something defending the Christian faith, and then you, in the comments section you can get these vitriolic and acerbic responses, ugly uh, responses, and it's easy in threads uh, on social media for uh, people to get condescending and, and sharp. And, and we do look at, for example... Stephen in Acts 7, now Stephen was quite pointed in denouncing the Jews and uh, in pronouncing God's wrath upon them. It doesn't, doesn't mean there isn't a time when we can be firm and forceful and warn people and admonish people and be strong in our language, but the, the overall tenor and tone needs to be one where we're trying to help people, right? It's not that we're trying to win an argument trying to win people's souls, right? And so what will make a difference is doing it in a respectful way. Where in our time now, I'm not saying that we have to be timid in what we believe, but it can be helpful in opening a door and allowing for discussion if you say, okay, I want to understand your objection explain it to me, and then when, and, and listen, and say, well, let me, let me explain, here's my problem with that, and then you're doing it in a respectful way, rather than in a condescending way, well, you need to sit down and listen to me tell you how wrong you are about everything you believe, and how right I am, and I have all the answers, and what you believe is dumb, and that, that's not going to be effective, is it? So we're to do it with this gentleness and respect. And, when you, and, and in that case, then, you can have a clear conscience. And so when, pe when you're slandered, then, those who revile your good behavior in Christ, they may be put to shame. We're not giving them any cause to speak evil of us. And really, in the end, you might even win people over it, and people will be ashamed for treating you badly because you've been treating them in a respectful way. For it's better, he says, to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will. Now, you listen to a lot of these wealth and prosperity preachers, and they act like it's not God's will that you should suffer. 
but that it's God's will for you to be brought out of any hardship and into prosperity and uh, achieving your great dreams and your goals. It's, like, it's as though this, this therapeutic idea of Christianity and that, uh, that the Christian faith is a, a means of getting what you want and a better life for you. It might be God's will that I suffer. I might be called to suffer. That can be within the will of God. And we know that some more than others. So here's the example. Remember we said this is all about suffering like our Savior. Now Jesus is used as an example in ethical matters and the way we live and the choices we make and any number of things. But the primary emphasis on the example of Christ, especially by Peter, is in his suffering. In his suffering. For Christ suffered once for sins. This is a tremendously important statement, and it's theologically rich. Look at Christ suffered once. That's an emphasis in Hebrews over and over, that even though he suffered throughout his life, great sacrifice and hardship for us, speaking of his passion, what he went through uh, in going to the cross. He suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. So we're the unrighteous. That he might bring us to God. I love that language of distance, that metaphor, and that how sin separates us from God and that through Christ we can be brought back to God where we need to be. Being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit. Now this, this, is a, this sets out right here the biblical teaching on the atonement. What, what, is it, what does it mean when we learn that Jesus dying on the cross somehow makes us right with God. Well, there are a lot of people who want to say, well, Jesus in dying on the cross, he was just setting an example. What Peter said here, that's the, he was just showing you how we need to be willing to be loving and don't respond with evil for evil and, and be willing to suffer. But they oppose the idea. There's a lot of scholars, a lot of academics, a lot of Christian, there's a lot of theologians and Christians who say, uh, it's wrong to think that God is angry with us for our sins and that Jesus had to be punished in our place. No, no, that's a medieval view of God. You don't want to think of God as being an angry God. And so they have a perverted concept of God that makes them think the cross really wasn't about punishment. But here, what does Peter say? The concept you get from this passage is the one you find throughout Scripture this will make you sound smartical. Bring this up with your religious friends over uh, lunch at Luby's later. Uh, yeah, our preacher was talking about penal. This is going to be on the test later, okay? So, uh, Katya, make sure you write this down. Uh, penal substitutionary atonement. What does he say? Penal. I mean, there was punishment. Christ suffered for sins. He was bearing our punishment. It was substitutionary, that is, he was standing in our place, the righteous for the unrighteous, and then that, Scripture is telling us, that satisfies the wrath of God so that he can bring us back to God, and so now we can be holy in the presence of a holy God. I'd love to explore that further, but I want to get to this point, and that is, Peter says, remember that you're saved. When you suffer for doing what's right, Remember that you're safe. So he talks about this here. As the text continues, he said, Now what about Jesus? He, he was put to death in the flesh, but we're picking up here. Made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. This is one of the most obscure and difficult statements in Scripture, certainly in the epistles in the New Testament. And it's given rise to a lot of fanciful interpretations. It's a difficult text. Where he says, he went and proclaimed. In the Spirit, somehow Jesus went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formally did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. And let me stop. Let me just explain what my view is of that verse very quickly without going into detail, but we can talk about it later if you have any questions. I think what it's saying is, see, see, some have argued this teaches that Jesus, when he died on the cross, so he was put to death in the flesh, but he was alive in the spirit, and he went in the spirit into hell, and he conquered Satan, and he went and preached to spirits who were locked in prison in hell or in Hades or in the realm of the dead. 
because Peter said he went and preached to the spirits in prison. No, I think the spirits in prison were in, were in Hades. They were suffering at the time Peter wrote, but the time the preaching was done was in the days of Noah. Well, how did Jesus preach to them in the days of Noah? Through, through Noah. Peter later calls him a preacher of righteousness. So Noah, the Lord Christ, through the Spirit, preached through Noah to the people at that time, and they died lost. And now they're being held in prison, if you will, under punishment, waiting the day of judgment. All right, there's a lot more to that, but let me just say. Now, what does he say, though? He brings up the ark. When God's patience waited in the days of Noah, I brought it back here in this next slide. While the ark was being prepared, in which a few, notice that, only a few people were saved. We're not going to explore that further, but that's a whole point in and of itself. That is, eight persons were brought safely through water. Your, your Bible might say, were saved through water. Now, a lot of times, people in the churches of Christ are ridiculed. This is one form of persecution. We're kind of mocked and viewed with disdain as people who believe in water salvation because we teach that baptism is essential to salvation, that you have to be baptized, Acts 2.38, for the remission of your sins. That's the biblical reason for baptism, stated explicitly in Scripture. And they say, well, if you think you have to get baptized to get saved, then you're, you're teaching that somehow water saves you and so they would argue that's baptismal regeneration. No, we don't hold baptismal regeneration, that the water itself or the act itself saves you. And this verse explains that. So he's saying, in the days of Noah, God told them to build an ark, and they were brought to the new world. From the old sinful world, God brought these souls into the new world, into a new condition by sending water to wipe out that old world. So he says, this was, their salvation was through water. In some way, God used water to get them to a new condition. And he's saying, that's like baptism. What corresponds to that? Baptism. That's what God does to you, and bap baptism now saves you. But he's saying, look, it's not the water because the water removes dirt from your body. No. It's God who saves you. It's the blood of Christ that cleanses you. But he's saying the, the, way, the sense in which it saves you is God told you to do it, and God said, that's the point at which I'm going to save you. So what you're doing in getting baptized is you're not trying to earn your salvation on the basis of your own good works. You're making an appeal to God to save you. The text that says baptism saves you is the very text that says it's an appeal to God. It's not an appeal on the basis of our own work. And it's through the resurrection of Christ. It's an appeal to God to save you because of what Jesus has done. Because he died to bear my sins and was raised for my justification. Notice he mentions he was raised. That typically, as he said earlier in the verse, it's the death of Christ that's emphasized in our salvation. He died for our sins. He suffered for our sins. But he was also raised. There are a few times where, for example, earlier in 1 Peter, we're saved through the resurrection. He was raised from the dead. Romans 4.25, he was raised so that we could be put right, so we could be justified with God. It wasn't just that he died, but in being raised, he vindicated his identity. It was the means by which God declared he truly is the Son of God. It showed sin had no power over him. He was the perfect sacrifice for sin, and it's therefore the reason he can deliver us from the power of sin. So this, his resurrection is critical. That's why Paul says we're saved not just by his death, but by his life. By his life. We tend to emphasize the death. But the resurrection is just as essential to our salvation. This is the final point, but it's just one last verse. And we're going to close here. When you suffer for what's right. Remember, remember that last point. He's saying that you were saved now. And you made this appeal to God. And so you can have a clear conscience now because of what Jesus did. And know this, that Christ has triumphed and we are victorious in him. Because here's how the text ends. 
What about Jesus after he died and after he was raised? He's gone into heaven and he's at the right hand of God and angels, authorities, and powers have been subjected to him. He's reigning. He's in control. And he is victorious even over death itself. And so I don't have to fear death. I know one day that itself will be put under his feet also, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. And Christ will reign and we will reign with him forever and ever. That's the perspective that we need to keep when we suffer in this life and especially when we suffer for the Lord. Whatever hardship you're being called to bear, make Christ Lord in your heart. And remember, he's the one in charge. He's the one that's reigning the question is, is he reigning over you? Are you submitting to that rule? That's what you need to do in response to this. And if we can help you do that, let us know. Let's stand and sing this song together.